I'm next going to be joined by Mal O'Hara. Uh, Mal is the leader of the Green Party of Northern Ireland and also a councillor. And throughout the next bit of time, we're going to be talking to Mal about the um, the current political deadlock in Stormont and also the uh, the Green Party's response to that. And I can see that Mal has now joined. So without further ado, uh, Mal, thank you so much for joining the show. How are you doing today? Good morning, Chris, and thanks very much for having me. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining. Um, so let's kick things off then. So uh, a lot of our viewers will be outside of Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you could give us a little bit of an overview of the current situation at Stormont, the political deadlock, how we got here and what's going on. OK, Chris, so I suppose th firstly, thanks for having me and welcome to the, the listeners. Um, so <clears throat> in Northern Ireland, we have a structure um, which is from the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, and that provides our governance in Northern Ireland and our government and our institutions and how they um, operate, or as the case might be, not operate, Chris. Um, uh, your, your listeners might be intrigued to know that since 1998, over 40% of the time, we've had no executive or government, and we've had a series of crisis and collapse of the Assembly throughout that period. But essentially, the Good Friday Agreement is premised on three strands. Um, those strands are the east-west relationship, so between the islands of Britain and Ireland, the north-south relationship between the north and south of Ireland, and then the third strand is the internal relationship. And that's about mechanisms and institutions that prevent majoritarianism and a return to the potential conflict in the past. So our structure requires that in appointing a first minister and a deputy first minister, that you must have majority support from the MLAs who designate as nationalist and the MLAs who designate as unionist. We have 90 MLAs, when they're all elected, they have to designate nationalist, unionist or other. Um, and in this instance, the DUP withdrew from the executive last February. And because they have the largest share of the unionist identified MLAs, then government cannot function without their support. So they withdrew. Um, that's because of the protocol situation. They had been threatening it for a period of six to nine months. Um, and essentially what they're saying is we will not operate the functions of government in Northern Ireland while the NI protocol remains in place. Um, and their sense is, although the protocol is about trade and movement of goods, their sense is because there are barriers to internal trade within the UK, so GB to Northern Ireland, then that diminishes their identity as British citizens. They don't have full rights um, because they can't trade with, without unfettered access. So that's where we are. They have withdrawn from government. That has caused government to collapse. We had a period of um, six months where um, ministers could operate in a, a zombie form. They couldn't bring anything that was cross-cutting or controversial because we had no executive. So ministers were operating within their own purview as a minister, but with very limited very limited powers to make decisions or resource because we'd set no budget. Um, so we've had that stasis. The legislation was that um, after a period of time, 28 weeks after an assembly election, the Secretary of State had the power to call an election. But as I'm sure you've all seen in the news, he has repeatedly delayed that. And now we have a delay until potentially February 2024. Um, this is not the first time we've had that crisis. In 2017, Sinn Féin withdrew from government. We had no government for three years. We had a period from 2002 to 2007 with no government. We've had in and out ministers. Um, we have had rotating ministers. Um, we've had a series of talks and amendments to the Good Friday Agreement over the last 24 years, but we still keep reaching crisis and collapse and it's hugely frustrating for those of us who want good governance and delivery for people in northern ireland that was the short version chris i hope that was okay um that as a 101 to the governance of northern ireland that was incredibly helpful and uh, actually one of the the most succinct and clear explanations as to the whole setup and the the, the crisis that i've heard actually um so you're obviously the leader of the Green Party in Northern Ireland. How would your party solve the problems that have led to the deadlock? Well, I think, Chris, for us, I suppose the repeated frustration is we have a rinse and repeat approach in Northern Ireland. So every time we have crisis and no government, 
what happens is the executive parties, so Sinn Féin, the SDLP, the DUP, the Ulster Unionists and the Alliance Party, alongside the two governments, British and Irish governments, go behind closed doors, cook up a deal, um, come back, produce a shiny new document, which is essentially Swedish for everybody, um, and promise it'll be different. Inevitably, two to three years later, we reach crisis again. Um, so we had an agreement in 2016 after one of the previous periods of crisis after the in and out ministers. They called it fresh start. Um, nine months later, we collapsed for three years and had no government. Um, then in the face of the nurses strike in winter 2019, 2020, nurses for the first time in Northern Ireland were going on strike because of pay agreements. Rightly so, we stood in solidarity with them. Um, and that put huge political pressure and we had a return government. And that was called New Decade, New Approach. Promise it's different this time. Um, and of course, I, I think it's fair to say if we hadn't had a global pandemic, we may have had collapse before last year when the DUP withdrew from government. Um, the New Decade, New Approach commitments have not been fulfilled um, to any great extent. Um, and, and that's because that was a deal that was sweeties for everybody and put the pressure on the parties to go back to government. So we don't want a repeat of that process because inevitably we will be back here in a number of years. Um, so what we actually want and what we're advocating, and we're going to produce a policy paper on this, is the use of citizens' assemblies to address the areas of concern that are repeated stumbling blocks. And just for your listeners, citizens' assemblies, um, they're starting to be used in local authorities in Britain. Um, Scotland has used them a few times, but the example that might be useful for people is in the Republic of Ireland. They had citizens' assemblies on abortion law, abortion and reform to the constitution and equal marriage law. And essentially what that is, is um, a randomly drawn selection of individuals um, and they'll be weighted for demographic balance, will spend a, a series of weekends debating a controversial or challenging issue. They will take evidence from academics, uh, stakeholders, political parties, trade unions, civic interest groups, and then they will formulate a proposal or a way forward on that. And what it does is it provokes a wider civic debate, Chris, which is great because it's in the political discourse, it's in the news, it's in the media, it generates a conversation. And then when the question comes, and in the case of the site, there was two referenda on abortion and marriage, people had a well-formed opinion and they knew what they were voting on. It wasn't the mistake that Brexit was, where Brexit means 17.4 million things to everybody who voted for it. There was a really recent debate in advance of it. So we advocate using citizens' assemblies as a way forward to address the, the, the fact that one party can have a veto and stop us from having government. This time it's the DUP, the, re, the time before that it was Sinn Féin. Um, so we can do that. We can reform our structures of government to make them sustainable. They can have a, a mechanism that protects against majoritarianism or majority rule um, and protecting minority roots, role, or sorry, rights, but also that, that we can have good and stable government. We can also maybe address some of the other vexatious issues that we haven't addressed, such as legacy, um, which is still an issue and a hot topic in Northern Ireland. 25 years after the Good Friday Agreement. Um, but then also, you know, we would wanted to be looking at climate change, around looking at poverty and inequality, drug deaths, health care reform, etc. And I think that's the way forward because it gets public buy-in rather than a closed doors deal by political parties. So we've talked a little bit about the kind of constitutional setup in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, just the last time I was in Belfast was in 2017. Okay. And it was uh, I was actually at Stormont on the day that the agreement was the deadline for an agreement was supposedly in place for the DUP and Sinn Féin to to uh, agree to form an executive, which obviously then got delayed and pushed and so on. Um, but the, the the political context in in Northern Ireland is of course built out of the the conflict of the troubles and the Belfast Agreement. You know, it's twenty five years since uh, that was. Uh, was signed and it came from a a political context of essentially you know of, of the troubles of conflict of violent political violence and so on and that's what the uh the institutions that were set up and the mechanisms that were set up were were designed to address and to to, to tackle um and to stop 
a revert, re, reverting into uh, armed conflict as a way of resolving uh, political issues. We're 25 years on from that now, and uh, Northern Ireland has changed significantly since then. Um, do you think that in that context, and given what you said that, you know, I think you think the figure you used was 40 percent of the time uh, that since since the Belfast Agreement, there hasn't been a functioning executive. Um, do you think it's time to, to look fundamentally about the again, about the principles of the Belfast Agreement, particularly as we've seen in recent years, that actually voters, uh, a growing number of voters are voting for uh parties which aren't unionist or nationalist, uh, but come into the other categories, whether that's Alliance or the Greens or others. Um, do you think it's time to, to look again at the institutions and whether we need a new constitutional framework which doesn't require, um, I guess, entrenching the, the political conflict of the past? Yeah, Chris and I, um, you know, fundamentally, we think it's time for that review. Um, the Good Friday Agreement, um, there's a phraseology that they often use about it is the ugly scaffolding of the Good Friday Agreement. So that kind of, you know, if you're thinking about renovation or building works that hold something together for a period of time while we're repairing. Um, and I think that the idea was that from the Good Friday Agreement, there were certain issues that were left unaddressed. Legacy is one of them. We've never had the Bill of Rights that we were promised from 1998. Um, the input of civic society was at the start, but very quickly done away with. We didn't have a second chamber. Um, you know, we we didn't do an anti-poverty strategy based on need. So there, there are lots of elements of the Good Friday Agreement that haven't been delivered. Um, and what has happened in that period of time, and I go back to the 2007 agreement, we had no government for five years, um, and then that was the St Andrews Agreement, and it changed the mechanism um, for um, how we appoint First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Um, in a later agreement, we were meant to have six MLAs for every constituency. We dropped that to five. So there were significant changes made to the Good Friday Agreement by the political parties and government um, without the input or consent of people, um, you know, directly. And I think that's the real challenge that it maybe got us to a certain point in terms of the absence of violence, but we need to go much further. And I think the hope and optimism that we had in 98 and also the inclusivity um, we we did a mechanism before 1998, which was the forum election and the talks, and it was the, the 10 parties who scored the most votes were all invited to participate in talks. So we had an inclusive process. We made sure that the voices of loyalism were brought in. We had a party called the Women's Coalition because they formed because women's voice very often wasn't at the table in Northern Ireland, so that we had a more inclusive approach. But over the last 25 years, our our approach has become more exclusive and narrower and narrower and narrower. And that means that only the really the interests of political vested interests are being heard in those talks. And that's why we keep changing the agreement. That's why we keep getting the political instability, collapse, crisis, um, and then a shiny new document that pretends everything's going to be different. And then we repeat the same process. So fundamentally, we need to bring citizens and civic society in. And that's what the mechanism of the citizens assemblies will do. Um, and that also means we get a wider buy-in and a societal discussion um, about how we can have structures that provide sustainable good government, protect from majoritarianism and respect minority rights. Um, I don't think the solution that the big five parties will come up with um, in hoc to government will last or be sustainable. I think we need people to buy in. And I, I think, Chris, the other frustrating thing for us is that, you know, the areas that were the most deprived and disadvantaged that are on peace lines, that are on interface lines at points of contact, particularly where I am in North Belfast, they're still deprived. The difference is there's not the violence, but the deprivation, the poor mental health the other wider health inequalities, lack of opportunity, lack of access to services, lack of good jobs, all of that still exists. And, you know, there's there's a significant portion of the population who don't feel that the promised prosperity and peace and opportunity that we, we, we you know, was sold to us in 98 has really been delivered. Um, so that's a huge frustration. So I've got one final question for you before I go to a couple from the chat. Um, and so the... The context we're in at the moment is that there could be fresh assembly elections soon. 
Uh, we don't yet know whether they will take place or when. Um, but in the last assembly elections, the Greens lost both of uh, their seats, uh, which made it the first time in 15 years where there hasn't been any Greens in the assembly. What do you think the prospects are for the Greens in 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 a, in a new set of um, assembly elections if they take place? And how are you going to ensure that Greens do get elected to the assembly next time? Yeah, so... Um... It's hugely frustrating for us, Chris, that we lost our two seats. Um, I want to pay tribute to those two MLAs, the former leader Claire Bailey and Rachel Woods MLA. Um, they passed two landmark pieces of law. Private backbenchers and members in the Northern Ireland Assembly can make law. Claire made a piece of law, which is around buffer zones, that will ensure that women can access reproductive health care and other pregnant people without being harassed or intimidated. Um, and that will be effect in effect from the 7th of May. That's landmark legislation across these islands. Scotland's following suit, the Republic's following suit. Um, and we, the Supreme Court was unanimous in its verdict that it balanced rightly between rights and responsibilities. Rachel's piece of law was paid leave for those experiencing domestic violence. Again, the first in um, the UK and Ireland, or the first in the UK, sorry, 10 days of paid leave. And we also forced the minister to bring a climate bill um, if we hadn't put a rival one on the table, the minister would not have brought his forward. Um, and I think for us, we were going into that election hopeful um, of expansion and increasing our vote. And I think in the last week or 10 days, it really titled, tightened to a constitutional question about whether a nationalist first minister or the protocol on the DUP, on the unionist side. Um, and that squeezed us. And ultimately, uh, people wanted to give the larger two parties a bloody nose. They identified Alliance as the best vehicle to do so. Um, so that was that was disappointing. We only lost a small share of vote, but it was enough to take our two seats. Um, if there are fresh assembly elections, we will be throwing everything we have at it to try and recoup those seats. Narrowly, politically, we would want an assembly election as soon as possible. Um, but the reality is that on the ground, the appetite amongst the wider population is not there. They cast their vote last May. They want to see that honoured. Um, so I kind of stuck in that position of wanting an assembly election for our own political interest, but being frank about what the, the wider public ap appetite is. Um, so I don't think we'll have an assembly election. Um, so we do have scheduled council elections in May. Um, and our focus at the moment is on those and ensuring that we um, increase our, our 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 representation and we consolidate the seats that we've held. Um, so we're running strong campaigns on local delivery on those issues. Um, but I think if we if we do go to a snap assembly election, we will be ensure putting everything that we can in place to make sure that we get representation in the assembly again. And I think, Chris, there's an appetite. People are disappointed to see that there's no greens in the assembly. Even those who maybe give us a lower preference would be minded to say, actually, I do want a green back in the assembly. I've seen the strength of the work that they've done, the issues that they're talking about, how they've dragged other parties forward on progressive issues, and they will vote for us. So um, it's not within our purview. It's up to the Secretary of State to make that decision, and he will be making that decision based on um, talks and considerations with the larger parties. So you mentioned the Secretary of State there, which uh, leads me on nicely to one of the questions that come in, in the chat. Um, so Ben Samuel has asked, uh, what your view is of the Westminster government's role in all of this, uh, the current situation with the deadlock at Stormont, uh, particularly in relation to its policy on Northern Ireland and the government's support for Brexit? Yeah, OK, so... Um... It's a difficult one. You know, we're Greens. We believe in grassroots democracy. We want decisions made at the lowest effective level. You know, it's it's not fair that there is an unelected Tory Secretary of State elected in, in England, but not elected in Northern Ireland. And the Tories never do very well in Northern Ireland. Um, there's no real mandate for them here. Um, we have our own version of Tories, actually, in Northern Ireland, so um, people can vote for them. But... Um, I think Chris Heaton Harris is trying to move things forward to get a deal and get a restored government, and I'll give him some kudos for that. Um, and the reality, Chris, is that in in Northern Ireland, the Assembly can't sort out the pro protocol. It's an international agreement between the UK and the EU. That's the space that it needs to be sorted out in and it looks like from the mood music and the choreography that there's going to be a deal um pretty soon 
The question then becomes whether or not the DUP can sell that deal to its supporter base. Um, and I think what we need from the Secretary of State is as much kind of leeway, um, as much good grace as possible to persuade pe people to go back to government here in Northern Ireland. We need local accountability. We need decision making. Um, we have the worst crisis in the parts of the UK um, for our healthcare waiting lists, either inpatient or outpatient. You know, we've creaking public services that haven't been invested in or reformed in decades. You know, and we and we still have some residual elements of political toxicity and lack of trust within communities or cohesion um so uh, the tories have been broadly emphatic about brexit um we always knew we said from from the very start that brexit would have a destabling impact on northern ireland um because it was a constitutional issue and people didn't you know they were too focused on ripping up red tape or rolling back workers rights or environmental regulations or food safety standards or whatever else it might be um to even consider the impact that it's had in Northern Ireland. And you can see since the vote in 2016, we had a period of three years without government. Then we had two years managing um, a, a global pandemic. And now we've had another year without government. So four of the last six and a half years without government. And in large part, that's down to um, the Brexit vote and the instability created by this. Um, I, I say to my pragmatic unionist friends, get the ni protocol sorted in some way or another accept the deal um and it, play, it gives northern ireland a unique position with access to both the eu and the uk markets which nowhere else in the world will have that will mean that companies um business will develop here will research here will base here that creates jobs opportunity um and wealth who would want to change that political constitution um, with all those benefits, but there doesn't seem to be anybody in unionism who's been pragmatic about that as a longer term future. So my last question from the chat uh, before I let you get on with the rest of your Sunday uh, is on a on a unrelated point, uh, but still I think an interesting question for you. Uh, so Finn White has asked, um, what is the Green Party in Northern Ireland's relationship with the Greens in the Republic? And how do you feel about the Irish Greens record in government? So obviously at the moment, uh, the Green Party in the Republic are in government with, uh, with Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, I think. You'll, <laughs> I think yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what's your take on the record in government? Um, so firstly, we are, we're an autonomous part of the Green Party of Ireland. So similar maybe to the wake up in England, Wales. Um, we have our own leadership, we have our own executive, um, but we're part of the Green Party in Ireland. And I think that's that's a practical realisation that we're two different jurisdictions on the island. We operate under different legislative process, laws, et cetera, um, particularly now post-Brexit. Um, so we have that frank uh, realisation, but we have the all-Ireland relationship. And I think for lots of people who are you know, Greens or passionate about the environmental and biodiversity crisis, recognizing that this island is one biodiverse unit makes sense. You know, air pollution doesn't stop at the border and um, water pollution doesn't stop at the border. Species decline doesn't stop when you cross an imaginary line. So um, there's a frankness about that. We also have strong relationships with the English and Welsh Greens, with the Scottish Greens and the European Greens. I voted against the programme for government. I didn't think we should go in um, on balance. The uh, For me, there weren't enough green wins in the programme for government. Um, and I voted against it and I was vocal. It's rare in politics that you want to be wrong, Chris. Um, but, you know, there are certain wins that are definitely coming from having Greens in government in the South. Um, I think about with the fact that they have a climate bill, they have a climate action plan, um, the fact that they are putting significant amounts of money into public transport infrastructure, they're moving the budget away from roads to more sustainable transport. Um, the minister, excuse me, Catherine Martin, is the uh, Minister for Culture and Arts um and the gale talk um and tourism and she's brought a universal basic income pilot for the arts community in ireland so um there's investment in town centers outside of major urban areas and um, to, to 
do a town center first and help regenerate those more rural communities. Um, so there are certainly wins coming through, um, uh, which which is great. We were involved in the program for government negotiations. Um, one of the successes from that, I think, is we have a shared island unit, which is up to half a billion pounds in infrastructure and capital investment. Now, some people in the negotiations wanted to call that a United Ireland unit. Um, but on this island, semantics and language is really important. So we argued, don't spook the unionist horses by calling it a United Ireland unit. Call it a shared island unit, because that doesn't predispose what the constitutional future might be, but recognises the reality of a shared island. And we've started to see lots of infrastructure and capital investment coming through that mechanism, which is which is really great as well. So um, I... I think it'll be interesting to see what happens in the election in the South. We've had recent discourse um, about Sinn Féin in government with the Greens. Um, so that might be another interesting conversation in 18 months or two years' time. Um, uh, but again, that'll be premised on what can be the Green wins out of any sort of negotiation for government. It's been an absolute pleasure, Mal. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. It's